Hi, th thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Joel Berger, and it's my honor to welcome you to this section of the CSU Global Biodiversity Center's first summit. Um, the mission of the GBC is to advance an understanding and conservation of biological diversity. And we advance this through four pillars. These are research, policy, education, and outreach. CSU is really a leader in applied biodiversity research. We were recently ranked as one of the top 10 institutions in the world by the Center of World University Rankings. Our faculty, postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduates participate in programs locally and throughout the world, as you just saw in that video. We collaborate with Future Earth, which is an internationally sustainable research initiative which funds research and applied conservation in an effort to make environment and landscape and waterscape issues relevant to society. At this point, I want to thank the College of Business, Natural Resources, Liberal Arts, Natural and uh, Sciences and Veterinary Sciences, and the Departments of Biology and FWCB, Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology, as well as the Office of International Programs and Whole Foods for helping to sponsor us today. I also want to thank, thank Jacob Job, who has helped put this together and worked tirelessly, as has Dr. Chris Funk, um, who's the director of our program. Before I introduce the panelists, I want to offer a couple of quick snippets. As I said, my name is Joel Berger. I work internationally and nationally, mostly at high latitudes, also high elevations in different parts of the world. The species that I target are oftentimes bigger than a bread box. I do this because there's some public recognition and I think it's easier to communicate a message to a public that maybe isn't thinking deeply about biological diversity per se. I also ask the question, what do we want the world to look like 20 years from now? And just as importantly, what are we as individuals trying to do to move towards that vision? And now I want to exercise my prerogative and some bragging rights and introduce our stellar panel members. And so I'll point out that amongst our members, we have editorial prowess on the best conservation journals in the world. They serve on editorial boards of conservation letters, the Journal of Biological Conservation and the Journal of Conservation Biology. In addition to that, they've served in guided panels from Washington, D.C to Europe and from Africa to Asia. So our, our panel members will be Elaine Leslie, who's the Chief of Biological Resources in the Washington, D.C. office of the National Park Service. There are 406 national park units. Elaine deals with many of these. And she's situated, as is her team, seconded to Fort Collins. Um, her focus has been on at-risk species, invasive species, as well as wildlife health and conservation stewardship. Not a small part of her task is that, as I said, 406 units. There are 280 million visitors to national parks. There are a lot of natural resource challenges. 280 million visitors, to put that in perspective, that's more than professional baseball, football, and basketball attendance in any given year. Those are some of the pressures. Elaine deals with these. Elaine works with climate challenges. She works with bio blitzes. She works with and has brought into the Park Service fold luminaries like E.O. Wilson and Jane Goodall. And she's also worked tirelessly on initiatives, some dealing with aerial, terrestrial, and marine migrants. She's worked as, uh, in private industry in both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem. She worked at Grand Canyon for 10 years. Um, 
Another panelist is George Wittemeyer, who's an associate professor here at CSU in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology. George grew up in Portland. He read books about Alaska and Canada and thought that he was going to end up working in Alaska and Canada. But as a student at Colorado College, to our south, a couple of hundred miles, he did a field trip to East Africa and he's been working on African issues for at least 20 years. George is a world-renowned expert for elephants. His attendance is highly sought at many different kinds of meetings. He's testified on Capitol Hill. He's testified to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And he serves as chairman of the scientific board for the Kenyan-based NGO, Save the Elephants. We also have Sarah Reed. Sarah um, did her PhD at University of California at Berkeley. She currently serves as the Director of Applied Conservation Sciences for the Americas program, Americas, so that's connecting South and North America, for the New York-based Wildlife Conservation Society that has 300 field programs in about 50 to 60 countries. She's an affiliate member of the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology here and mentors a team of postdocs PhD students, graduate students, and undergraduates. She also serves as the Vice President for Programs for the International Society of Conservation Biology and co-leads the Conservation Development Working Group for the School of Global Environmental Sustainability, which I should have said is the overarching um, group that has uh, facilitated CBC and the CBC in today's um, milieu. In Sarah's spare time, she enjoys cooking and travel um, and mentors youth at risk. Okay. Last, and certainly not least, is Josh, uh, Josh Tewksbury, and Josh leads the Global Hub for Future Earth, and together with Chris Funk, they brought in uh, is a $2 million, uh, $2 million grant that helps support research globally and does a lot more than just support research, which I will detail in a second. Um, before doing that in a prior life, Josh was the natural, uh, an endowed professor of natural history at University of Washington. He was also the founding director of the Luke Hoffman Institute in Switzerland, which focuses on global research on the co-creation of multidisciplinary programs and he's launched um, himself over a dozen programs aimed at food, water, and the next generation, focusing in Southern Asia, Southeast Asia, but in other parts of the world too. And so I think it's clear, at least in my view, um, that what we have is not just science represented here, but we have people that are working to make a difference. We're lucky to have them here at the table today. And so I'm going to ask the panelists to come up. Each are going to talk for about five minutes, and then we'll be taking some questions. just going to go in the order in which I did the introductions and be sure you speak into the microphones. Okay, I think that's me. All right. Can you hear me now? Well, thank you, Joel and Chris and the university for, for having us here today. Very honored to be invited. So again, thank you. Um, I did write some remarks down just because I was traveling uh, well into the wee hours of this morning. and. In the words of someone from my generation, I was a little afraid I'd be running on empty. Uh, so I just want to make sure I remember everything. So again, thank you, everyone. So um, last year, 2016, uh, marked the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. So 2017, we are now in 101. <laughs> so one of my uh, main focuses is to figure out, OK, what are we going to do for the next 100 years and based upon what we accomplished in the last 100 years? So in preparation for that milestone of two, 2016, our director launched a call to action. 
And that was a strategy that outlined a new vision of NPS stewardship for the National Park Service for the next 100 years. And one that would contribute to the relevancy, youth, the public engagement, whatever that issue is, that we had the word relevant included in, in our mission. So this vision ensures that the opportunity for the public could discover our parks and our resources in a meaningful way. Um, and at a meaningful level to them, as well as help the NPS uh, respond to challenges facing us, which uh, Joel uh, uh, it iterated a few of those things. So not just climate change and invasive species, and, but fragmentation and huge vegetation increase. Uh, we saw that throughout the last two years, and it continues this year. And if you think about parks and capacity and uh, funding people, people on the ground trying to protect resources. It's a real challenge, and, and like I said, it's increasing. But we also want to engage youth at a meaningful level. Um, and so that's what our challenge is right now. So this call to action item that I have been engaged with with the last 10 years was called the Next Generation Stewards. And it was to create a new generation of citizen scientists and future stewards of our parks by conducting fun, engaging, and educational biodiversity discovery activities in at least 100 parks. And so we managed to do that, and actually in about 150 to 160 of our 417 parks. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll, we'll be at 417 for a while, I think. I don't think we'll be increasing anytime soon. So biodiversity conservation and awareness has been greatly enhanced our parks through these efforts and through increased knowledge of species as well, pub, as well as public education and engagement. The concept of biodiversity conservation and discovery has rapidly become a, framework, a common framework for community conservation, education, and action within and outside of our park boundaries. And I will tell you one thing, that um, when I first came into the Park Service about 25 years ago, um, biodiversity conservation, it's in our policies, but nobody actually understood what that meant. So now we actually have dialogue. People understand it took Culture change is hard, right? Turning the Titanic takes a while. You run into icebergs now and then. Um, but now we have employees across the service who really do have much better understanding of their role in biodiversity conservation in protected areas. So that's a success in itself. Over the last de decade, MPS um, has uh, successfully um, put together a framework for these kind of biodiversity activities within these parks. Parks participated in varying levels and on varying taxa, um, but they really all included professional scientists, and part of that goal was to increase relationships with parks and protected areas and the scientific community and the educational community, and we did that. Open up parks more to students, children, families, staff, and park visitors. And and during that period of 10 years, I will tell you, we observed thousands of species in the parks, and many of those were not known to have existed in those parks. So those relationships with those scientists were hugely important to sit there and document what we actually have in a park. And, and generally when they were doing that, there was a kid right by their side, a kid who had never even been in a park in their own backyard. So hugely illuminating. And not only new species to parks, but new species to science as well. So these bio blitzes contributed greatly. Um, beyond the statistics and the numbers, I can get those to you. They're on our website if you're interested in those. We're now speaking that language of biodiversity. Underserved and underrepresented um, participated in the bio blitzes. And a core of biodiversity youth ambassadors are now employees working in national parks or in protected areas. And, and we had many partners, National Geographic, the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, many, many others. So, and we appreciate all of those who, who participated, even in our own backyard right here at Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, the NPS sees the progress of Next Generation Stewards as a proof of, proof of concept case study and now is ready to evaluate how to best advance biodiversity conservation and discovery in the Park Service as well through what has now evolved into a community stewardship program. So this is a team of well-qualified scientists in my group that now work with parks 
their gateway communities, uh, especially uh, connection to the urban areas, um, to bring young minds in to be stewards of those parks. Um, it's a really great program. It's just now getting up and underway, and we see a lot of, a lot of potential there. Also with tribes. Uh, we have a tendency to forget about tribal communities, and that's very important. And so many, especially of our western parks, have tribal affiliations. Grand Canyon, for instance, has 27 or 28 tribal affiliations associated with that geographic area. So we need to make sure we're as inclusive as possible. So the National Park Service is committed to continuing a national and global leadership role in biodiversity conservation. Uh, this decade-long approach has cultivated a support network of community of practice, very large community of practice of about 400 people that meet on a regular basis, virtually. <laughs> Um, and it'll ensure that our parks have, can learn from each other and have these experiences and build upon success as an expertise. Um, a big challenge for us is not only these impacts, and yes, we can still talk, we can say the words climate change and together still, so we're, we're fighting that fight, um, so that's a good thing. But data and data sharing is, is a very important thing. It's a very difficult thing when you're trying to work at a landscape level. So there's a lot of folks in states and federal agencies trying to solve that one because we're never going to make that, like I said, landscape scale approach work if we can't figure out how to better share our data. So we need to work together to find a persuasive message that educates our American public so they want to conserve biodiversity. So it's not only just explaining what biodiversity is, it's we want them to conserve it um, and what those integral parts of the Earth's biological portfolio are. Our NPS goal is that we want people to protect and conserve biodiversity in their parks and in their own backyards. How many people live in apartment complexes, especially in some of the underserved communities. But having a little uh, flower box on their shelf and a packet of native pollinator seeds, I can tell you how far that will go. Um, it's really very inspirational when you start working with kids on those sort of things. Again, because we want them to conserve, um, not because they have to. So the very word biodiversity represents not just a suite of scientific principles, but it's our value and our culture and our emotions. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Well, thanks, thanks, Elaine. Um, I'm just gonna give you a little context. I'm coming from a, a bit of a different structure given that I'm more infused in, um, in academia, so I do a lot of academic science. Um, and I've been focused on sort of species specific conservation issues. And so um, in my experience from sort of the games that, that I've had to play or been involved in playing uh, related to conservation, uh, biodiversity conservation, um, awareness obviously is where we start. Um, the recognition that climate change is driven by humans has, is now potentially recognized by 70% of the American public, which is a huge step. Um, but that's taken us several decades to reach, so it's relatively slow. Um, the key part of that recognition by the American public is that while 70% recognize climate change is an issue, human-driven, um, very few think it's going to affect them. And so the connection, there's awareness of this issue, but the connection uh, to the ind individual level, which is really critical to elicit action, um, is still lacking on something as obvious as climate change. And, and this has been an issue um, that, we, that I've had to deal with when we're dealing with species-specific issues as well. We can bring awareness uh, about a topic, but the, the next really critical step is connecting people to it. Um, I happen to be really lucky because I work a lot on elephants, and, um, and so that connection is pretty easy to do. Charismatic species uh, are really critical uh, for connecting the public, engaging the interest of the public, and and getting them to, to actually take action. And so I'm somewhat limited in my scope on how to get the connection to happen because it was already there before I arrived on dealing with some of these problems. Um, but I think 
there's, there's many approaches to get connections. We have uh, the, the critical issues that we're facing in our local communities, uh, getting people connected to their local natural resources is not actually uh, prohibitively difficult to do. Um, getting them out there, seeing them, talking about threats is the first step to, uh, on them recognizing what's going on locally and, and taking action locally. And obviously that's critical for, for eliciting action. Um, and, then, and then when we have more global issues that are more tangential or farther away, that's where I think you need a, a spokesperson or a spokes image which um, elephants or, or landscapes can serve as. Um, the, next, uh, the next thing I look at in, in, in when I'm thinking strategically about how to play out, how to elicit action on a biodiversity conservation issue is really coming up thinking about uh, what the key threats and the points of susceptibility are to the problem you're dealing with. Um, with the work we've done with African elephants, uh, the, the major threats, like all large iconic wildlife, is, is loss of landscape uh, and loss of habitat. But we also have uh, commercial trade, economic driven harvesting of the species coming in. That, those kind of influences happen rapidly. Uh, there's, there, because it's a high value asset, you get um, very organized systems to remove these species illegally, and it's quite hard to combat. And so, we took um, a, a multifaceted approach. When I say we, I'm talking about the global community worried on this, worried about this issue. Um, and we wanted to work both to identify uh, those populations most susceptible to illegal harvest. And we did this through a monitoring program to look at uh, essentially trying to quantify rates of illegal killing across populations. That helped us identify these source populations that are at greatest risk. Um, we also uh, collaborated and interacted with uh, groups such as uh, Traffic, WWS Traffic, which uh, collects all seizure data on different species. And that information was used to try to identify trade routes uh, in order to disrupt those trade routes. And similarly, similarly that data was used to uh, identify the demand uh, consuming nations of the product. Um, so once those sort of key points of susceptibility were identified and presented, uh, the next step in my, so my step four is to create partnerships. You recognize the threat. The threat's been quantified. It's been identified. You identify partnerships to try to tackle those threats. Uh, everybody has different skills, so you diversify what you're doing. Um, and then with those partners, the, the, the step five I, I'd have is you need to develop a strategy to address the threats. Um, and so we've dealt with a, a diversity of strategies in the, in the ivory poaching issue um, that's dealt with trying to disrupt uh, il, you know, global uh, criminal syndicates that are doing trafficking of these products. Turns out they're doing human trafficking, oil, minerals. Um, they're very adept, very good at this. And um, it's way beyond the capacity of the biodiversity conservation community to really tackle those people. But it's not beyond the realm of the Department of Justice, uh, the, the Treasury Department in the US, they are, they're already doing this. They're already tackling these guys. And so getting them on board, um, dealing with politicians to get them interested in these problems becomes really critical. And different people have different access to these groups. Obviously, public engagement is critical. Um, and so you need to bring sort of all your all your arrows in the quiver to bear when you're trying to tackle some of these things. Um, so there's many things. The, the other thing that we did is, is uh, that became really important to us was, was, uh, was the individuals that convene groups. So individuals that can attract uh, diversity of people to the table. Um, and in the case of the elephant story, this turned out to be the Clinton uh, global initiative was, was pretty effective at that. The Clintons were interested in this. They're, they're superstar politician types and they were able to bring a lot of people to the table to start discussing these things. Even people that aren't politically affiliated with them or interested, there's, the, the, the stardom brings recognition and people like the recognition. The other group that's been really active in, in the UK is the palace, so the royal families also convened and brought people together. Everybody at the table talking about, we, we had the points of, of the, the susceptibility points identified, everybody at the table talking about how we can tackle them becomes um, a much more collaborative and effective engagement. Um, and so from that, the strategy is built. We actually have, there's a thing called an African elephant action plan that, that the idea is the strategy is built out with uh, range nations, everybody signs on it, and then we can use that to fund and try to tackle these, these key points. So that's sort of the approach we've used for dealing with, um, with this specific instance of biodiversity conservation. I just thought I would highlight some of that tale and how we proceeded with it.
So that was mine. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I also want to extend a thanks to the Global Biodiversity Center for organizing this event and giving us the opportunity to kind of dig ourselves out of our daily work and think about these big questions that are ultimately what I think probably motivate most of us in our careers. Um, I really want to make uh, two points today that are sort of centered on one theme, um, and that is that I think that we need to reorder the question that we've been asked to answer, which is how do we move from awareness about biodiversity loss to action, to, to really ask more how should the need for conservation action be driving our biodiversity science. And, and the first way that I think we need to think about that is that there's a lot of need right now to invest in building skills among individual scientists as well as relationships between the producers of biodiversity science and the consumers of that information, so conservation practitioners of various sorts, to really think about how we can define the research questions that really need to be asked before any science takes place, and to design a research process that is well tailored to answer those questions. And note that I said process and not project or product, um, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But in recent years, we've seen a lot of investment in uh, training and resources for science communication. So training scientists to be more effective communicators to a variety of different types of audiences, from the public to decision makers to natural resource managers. And that's tremendously important um, to both elevate and in some cases to defend the role of science in public discourse. Um, but I think that in many cases, it's still a bit of a shotgun approach. So we're putting all of this messaging out there without being sure that it's going to reach the people that it needs to reach at, at the right time or with the right sort of content to actually inform decisions that are happening on the ground. And so the question I want to ask is kind of how do we build those audiences for that communication in advance and ensure that they're actually asking for the information before we start communicating it. Um, and I really, this is the point where I really need to credit the members of my lab group for helping me to put a fine point on this um, when we had a similar conversation a couple of weeks ago. But what they're telling me is that they know now where they can go for training and resources around science communication. But what they don't know is where they can go for training and resources around kind of how to design a project in the first place to answer a question that needs to be answered. Um, and so that's where I think we need to put our efforts next, is in building training and resources for those technical skills to identify the context of a decision and what sort of information would be most useful, as well as the interpersonal skills that are needed to build what are often long-term trusted relationships to ensure that interchange between science and practice. So again, I'm saying we need to build, invest in building the skills of individual scientists and also in building those relationships between the producers and consumers of biodiversity science. But I think what I want to point out is that, as usual, in this solution, I think we're asking a lot of individual scientists that they take this on, on top of everything else that they're already doing, that they now not only need to be masterful public communicators, but also savvy policy wonks. And so that kind of brings me to my second point, which is that I think we also need to recognize that the integration of scientific research and conservation action is a process. It's not a single project. It's not a single product, and it's not a single interaction between a scientist and a policymaker. And facilitating what is often a long-term process requires considerable investment and also considerable expertise in that specific interchange. Um, so in other words, it's probably not achievable via a single training or a book, although those resources would be very welcome and helpful. Um, but it's a sustained investment that needs to be professionalized and funded adequately. Um, so in some cases, that might mean creating positions within existing institutions to specialize in that role, what is often called a knowledge broker in the literature. It might also mean creating entire institutions to specialize in that role, what are often called boundary organizations. Um, or 
some of the convening organizations that, that George described. So I'll, I'll probably stop talking now and just sort of acknowledge that I'm asking for a lot, which is a lot more than just reordering how we're asking that question, but actually changing the shape of the scientific process from a linear process to ideally one that's more cyclical or probably looks more like the adaptive management cycle. And I'm also saying that we need to find a bunch of money to hire professionals or create new organizations to make this happen. But, but I would argue that that's really what it's going to take if we want to move from our understanding of biodiversity loss to effective conservation. And, and as a group, I think as, as constituents of this process, I know there's a lot of students in the room, a lot of scientists, a lot of grant recipients hopefully a program officer to um, maybe some donors to conservation organizations, the voting public, uh, I think we need to think critically about how applied conservation research is being funded and implemented, and in particular, in encourage our funding institutions, both public and private, to create an environment in which we can be successful with a more int strong integration between science production and consumption. So Sarah, that um, that was fantastic. Um, so uh, I felt like that was uh, it was a nice a nice sort of frame to where to what I'm going to talk about, which is a, a simple maybe say restate some of your points in a slightly different context. And I, I would say that the question that we were posed as the panel is how do you move from awareness to action? And I'd like to make sort of three sort of points along that route, and then go back and sort of articulate some of those. Uh, the first is that most decisions about biodiversity around the world aren't biodiversity decisions. They're made by constituencies that have very diverse values and very diverse sets of, in, of, of things that they're weighing and trade-offs. And oftentimes, biodiversity isn't at the table or isn't framed at the table in a way to have the impact it needs to have. The, the second, and this leads to my second, is that um, it's almost always better to be at the side of a big table to be at the front of a, than to be at the front of a small one. And I would say, Biodiversity science and academic, and academic institutions oftentimes favor, being, favor creating small tables with little impact rather than putting people at the side of big tables with larger impact. And I would say we act this way because our incentives allow us to, and that's our third point. In fact, they compel us to create small tables and, and lead those tables rather than, to, rather than to, to join much broader conversations that cross disciplines and cross sectors of society. And so, this is, this is as much about, and I, I think Sarah's point is very important here. It's not an individual problem per se. There are plenty of fundamentally invested and engaged scientists at the postdoctoral level, at the, at the graduate student level, at the professoral level that are trying to engage. But they don't, have the, they don't know how to do it. And part of that's because the institutions, by and large, haven't stepped up well enough to allow them to do that effectively. I would say CSU is probably something of an exception there, but I would say don't rest on your laurels. You're like in mile four of a marathon here. And so it is really important that all institutions, even if they see themselves leading, pushing much harder to figure out what haven't you done yet to allow your faculty to have greater impact, to allow your students to have greater impact. So when I say institutional change, I think it's not just about academic institutions, but I think it's, it's, bro it's, it's broader at a lot, a lot of levels. So first of all, I think we have to think about what is the big table we want to sit at? And I would say that right now, there is a planetary checklist out there of to-do items. There's 17 of them. It's called the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Four of them are the sweet spot for biodiversity. Life on land, life underwater, you know, clean water and sanitation, and climate action. That's where we show our value to other sectors of society in the biggest possible table. I would also argue that we haven't yet articulated a, a vision that says, if we don't meet those four objectives, we won't make the other 13. And where and why is that true? And then how does that differ in different parts of the world? That's a fundamental way of sort of showing value at a very large table. And that allows me to sort of step back and say, I think the best sort of approach for going from awareness to action is to be a part of a big tent, is to recognize that biodiversity on its own is not the top of most people's radar. Sustainability, su sustainability and how we, how we manage the next 25 years increasingly is. And, so, but, and I think biodiversity, through those four goals and other mechanisms, is fundamental to reaching any sort of sustainability we're looking for in the 2030 agenda at a global level, at a national level, at a subnational level. Getting into that agenda 
is the tricky spot, right? How do, we, how do we make sure they're there? So I think we spent 100 years in this country and around the world organizing disciplinary science to have great effect, linking scientists together within disciplines so they understand what those disciplines can provide to each other and largely within the discipline. Um, we haven't spent that kind of time thinking about how to organize science and non-scientists and thought leaders across, say, sustainability science or sustainability science and innovation. And I'll just give you one example. So two years ago, Elon Musk spoke at the American Geophysical Union. Why? I would argue he spoke there because there's nowhere else to speak. Because we, yet, we haven't yet f fundamentally structured our intellectual discourse in a way that allows thought leaders from academia and non-academic areas to come together around the very large sustainable issues, sustainability issues we're, we're facing and to do it in a professional society context where knowledge is leading, where academic professionals understand their role in the room. So that's a very large level bit of organization that I think we have to, we have to consider. Um, so do I have any other questions, any other things to do here? I think I've said all the things I have to say here. Um, yeah, and I've probably got about five minutes. So let me just say, let me just go back and just say that um, the, 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 three bit, the three things that I think needs to change here uh, uh, across all scales, which is that you know, the biodiversity is not just a biodiversity issue. It's a sustainability issue. It's fundamental to human existence on the planet, and we have to take that for front and center, um, that we all want to stretch further out. Oh, I, and, then, and that, you know, the incentive structures aren't, aren't there. I will say one more thing. I knew I was forgetting one thing. He said, oh, I work for an organization that helps with that. Um, so, uh, um, so, I mean, in a lot of ways, what Future Earth was, that was there, was created, was to serve this need. We are a boundary organization. There are 20,000 plus scientists engaged in Future Earth all around the world. We have offices in scores of countries. We have national networks in 25 countries. We have a, 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 an agenda that takes science and turns it and focuses it on major, major challenges, like food, like water, like energy, like biodiversity loss. That's what our job is to wake up in the morning and allow the science that you do to have greater impact. Um, and we need to be pushed to be better at that job, and we need engagement to do that well. So thanks for the opportunity to speak. So I think um, what I'd like to do now is to um, ask you in the audience to um, questions in either to individuals or you could just say the panel but please don't do your questions as a lecture make your questions so that they're a question uh, Jacob and I will move these around I wrote this down so that I wouldn't lecture on right um, and so I, I think it kind of builds off of the first intro that Joel had, that what do we want the world to look like in 20 years? And so I think in a big way, in a global way, the future of biodiversity will be decided in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, um, other biodiversity hotspots, the Amazon. And it's going to be, in some ways, by the future powers, not the past powers. And I mean that geopolitically, I mean that economically. So that's places like India, China, et cetera. So I, I think, what does that mean in terms of differing norm sets, value sets? Um, what China wants is not necessarily the same thing that kind of the American populace manifested through USAID, the National Park Service, et cetera, wants. So can, you, can the panelists kind of re reflect on that? Like, what does the future hold for biodiversity when you consider those things? Yeah. I'll just be very quick and say that uh, two things that I think is that uh, um, uh, that I think fundamentally, um, like speaking of Africa, for example, and and so you know, 80% of smallholder farmers are you know are you know of that of that continent are smallholder farmers, and so agriculture, the, the question of agriculture and the question of food security is the question of biodiversity in that continent, and um, it's not a it's not a question that's going to be answered by. Um, me or anyone else who's not really embedded in the, in the decisions of the continent. It comes from the continent. So part of it, I think, speaks to the long-term relationships that are ne needed to be sort of built to support the capacity to make sort of informed decisions and trade-offs in, in country, in continent. And so it, whether it's the US, China, India, or any other outside power, 
dictating the conservation policy, um, the degree to which they're going to be successful is, is, is inverse relation to the, the ability of that country to stand up for its values. And so part of, I think, the development of a biodiversity ethic in Africa is about the development of Africa itself, is understanding how those countries take, their, take responsibility for their own, how their institutions there are supported sufficiently to be able to lead that, their own discussion of their own future as a continent of Africa. Because we've been talking about the future of Africa from every other continent on the planet, and their voice isn't properly represented. So I'd say that's one key part of it. So I'll answer this question from the perspective of the Americas, which is my purview and my job, so North America and Latin America. And I think the future of biodiversity conservation is urban. So currently, the Americas are the most urbanized region on, on Earth. 80% of people in North America and Latin America live in cities. By 2050, nine out of every 10 people are going to live in a city. Um, and so we need to be working on biodiversity conservation solutions that clearly acknowledge that future. Um, and, and there's a variety of different ways that that can happen, but building connection between conservation that can occur in situ, in cities, in place, um, locally, like the kind of community stewardship programs that Elaine was mentioning in her introduction, all the way to figuring out how to build stronger connections um, between people living in cities and the conservation that, that is occurring in, in distant places. So I'll just add something quickly. I guess from, from my perspective, one of the things that um, is going on globally is it, it, so the, what, what, the world, what we want the world to look like in 20 years um, is going to be strongly con contingent on or, or uh, uh, founded on the degree with which human population growth is occurring in these areas. And so some of the problems being faced in these nations are, um, are different from anything that we've ever seen before or how to deal with as a, as a species, not speaking as a, as a country. Um, but um, but what, so what's, what's going on in these places, in my mind, is that you have um, this, we have some lessons that we've learned historically. Some of those lessons are very relevant to where these countries or how these countries are going to change and where they're going forward. And those lessons need to be shared in a productive manner. Um, and, and that, that doesn't always happen. I, so, so engagement with China, I think, by the West um, on environmental issues has been particularly uncollaborative and unproductive. Um, and in many ways, China is, is blowing the doors off what the US is doing now and some of their clim climate actions, right? But they're also dealing with enormous population issues. And so they're coming up with different models. And I, I feel like the, the global conservation community um, we need to build off each other's knowledge in a much more productive way rather than a fragmented way. And I think that's one of the, the limitations that it might, might not be internal to sort of our broader connections, but it's a, a function of sort of the geopolitical context in which we work. And so actively trying to work through those barriers is really critical. Um, yeah, so I, that was the point I was going to make. I'll just quickly build upon or add to what Sarah said. So I agree about the urban environment. It's, it's critical. Um, it's critical from an awareness and from a youth perspective as well. So I just came back from one of our national parks, Golden Gate, which is a, a myriad of parks from redwoods to the ocean, marine environments, terrestrial, the whole nine yards. It's a very complex. Um, wonderful urban park area that the people of the San Francisco Bay Area cherish. But people don't know that that particular park versus your Yellowstone, your Yosemite, your Grand Canyon has more at-risk species than any other unit in our national park system, and nobody knows that. <laughs> it's just, it kind of gets uh, dismissed. And it's really a very difficult challenge to, to try to educate people that right in your own backyard, these challenges exist to, to sustain what species we have at, at a very local level. And something that's really important is just a better understanding of the science. So take something, I don't, I want, I don't want to say this is simple, it's not simple, but monarchs. You know, an iconic species that every kid and every adult recognizes. We don't understand enough about that migration. Look at what's happening with fragmentation and pesticides and all of those kind of things. There are impacts that we don't, do not fully understand, let alone 
the terminus of that migration and what happens there, nor do we work closely enough with our international neighbors to be able to solve some of these things on a landscape level, so that's really important. And then lastly, I would just uh, not dismiss the Americas as being, <laughs> or, or our country as being uh, less of a biodiversity hotspot. We have so many that go unrecognized. And one of those, for instance, is in the southeast, and it's the Mobile Tensaw Bay area. And it is at risk, but it is a huge watershed full of biodiversity, also uh, right outside the door of where E.O. Wilson grew up. Um, but it's at risk. It's at risk from our oil spills and consumption. It's at risk from uh, increased hunting and recreational activities. And really, it's just a checkerboard of very small protected areas, but not on a watershed level. Um, but look it up. It's, it's an amazing biodiverse area of plants and animals, and it's one of those areas that we still have time to protect these things. I'm going to ask a question particularly focused at Sarah. Um, she said there was a great need for more funding, and I'd like to question that because $30 billion has been spent in Amazon in the last 20 years in conservation, and it may not just be we need more money, but maybe we need to be using the money more wisely. And I'd like to know what kinds of plans are to be using those, those funds and spread those funds more equitably. Yeah, I, I would actually agree with that. What I'm, what I'm arguing for is particularly on the research side that we think about using our funding differently when it's being targeted towards biodiversity conservation research that's intended to inform practice on the ground and that it needs to acknowledge again that, that the sort of traditional linear model of scientific research where we think of a question that um, you know, has some sort of basic uh, meaning and then kind of go through and implement the project and now we've sort of tacked on at the end communicating it broadly isn't getting the job done in terms of informing conservation that we need to reform that whole process and so that's just going to require um, I mean I would love to also see more funding go in that direction but it's just going to require a redirection of the funding and a change in expectations about what are the sort of key skills that are needed to do that work well? Um, and what are the timelines that are realistic for accomplishing, again, those long-term relationships that are needed to build trust and identify the decisions that could most benefit from the scientific research we're doing? Can I add to that a little yeah. bit? Just, just, I think that's, that's a really good question. And I think, I think, particularly in the research community, though, I think it's, it's worth recognizing, sort of stepping back a little bit and saying, well, why, why do countries fund science? And traditionally, countries funded science for economic advantage over other countries. Um, we're living in a space right now where um, increasingly the problems we face as biodiversity scientists are global commons problems. They cross borders. They're international. Most of them, most of the big ones, not all of them, but a lot of them have this international space. Um, and yet, you know, 99.99% .99 of all research funding that goes anywhere near this area is national in structure. There is no easy way to build research structures internationally right now in terms of a funding pool. The best thing we have probably from the public sector is the Belmont Forum, which is a fantastic organization made up of the most progressive parts of relatively conservative organizations around the world who have duties to support science in the broad sense and are just now dipping their toe into the idea that science doesn't just have to be done in a lab and science doesn't have to be just done by scientists. But science is a co-created process in, and then we think about that little s science as a process that involves all knowledge holders and, is, and starts with needs rather than with discovery. That's a, we're really right in the early phase of that. And for example, this isn't, an un, this isn't a problem that ha this problem has been solved in other sectors. We have the Global Environmental Facility. We have the Green Climate Fund. Now, we may not like where they spend their money, but those are financial facilities designed to allow nations to pool resources to, to, to answer big global problems you know, on the ground. We don't have anything like that for science yet. And so there's a lot of work we can do in that space to change the funding landscape so that it's, the direction is much more effective for what's going on in the Amazon, for example. I'll just add one little thing. Um, so I'm just going to add one little perspective. And this is not coming from academia. Obviously, it's coming from a land stewardship perspective and management. 
Um, the hardest thing we do in the federal government across the board is prioritize. And so prioritizing uh, is critical here, especially if there are no new, you know, green dollars from heaven falling down upon us, which it doesn't look like there will be, at least in the federal government, to land management agencies anytime soon. So how do we make those hard choices? And they need to be based on science, but we need to prioritize. And so just uh, sort of complementary to what Sarah was saying, that certainly we, we need to have that funding and that capacity to address these research questions. Um, we, in the federal government, these land management agencies in North America, need that science to make our decisions, but we have to prioritize where that's going. And like I said, that's really a very difficult thing to do. Um, we're going to take a question from back here. Hi. Um, so my question kind of builds on, oh, I'm Sarah, uh, and uh, my question kind of builds on the last one. Um, so Sarah, I really like your message that we need to package our science in a way that um, the consumers of it need or um, can use. And Josh, I like that you say that we need, or the institutions need to incentivize that. Um, I guess for me, I'm interested in pursuing ep academia. And on that note, I feel like um, often the sexy science is incentivized. And the things that the land management practitioners need, maybe I'm incorrect here, but is not generally the sexy science. So I feel like there's a disconnect there between what somebody that wants to pursue an academic career would maybe seek out and you know what what your message is. So I guess I'm just asking if you can speak to that. You, uh, oh no, you can start. Okay. Okay. Address to you, you've got it. Yeah, of course that's a hard question, right? Because because we're making the case up here that that those incentives need to change in order to sort of change the opportunities for, for someone in your situation. I think in the meantime, um, you know, there's, of course, a number of training programs that are out there to try to build these skills in individual scientists, which I've already acknowledged is an unfair expectation, but it may be a realistic expectation in the next several years. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Smith Fellows Program, um, which is a postdoc fellowship program funded by the Society for Conservation Biology with the express purpose of putting early career sci conservation scientists at the interface between research and practice. So when you specify a project for that postdoc fellowship program, uh, you're required to um, not only talk about how it's rigorous science and sort of meaningful for conservation application, but also to build a team of mentors that includes people on both sides of that divide. And then the program is designed um, for the postdocs who are selected, not just to provide research funding for a postdoc, but also to provide a series of trainings in those additional skills that uh, conservation scientists might need in order to be effective at bridging that divide. Um, so that's kind of one example, and, and I would say that I, I'm um, very involved with the Smith Fellows Program, really like it, happy to talk to anyone um, who is thinking about applying. But I would also say that we need to create those opportunities for more than five people a year <laughs> in North America. Um, and so we need to think about sort of how we can extend programs like that globally and make it available to people working in other areas of the world. And also think about how we can adapt those kinds of programs for people at different ages and stages of career. Um, and then I'll just say one more thing and then I'll stop talking. And that is that the other kind of in the meantime solution is that there are a number of institutions that are trying to build capacity, particularly for academic scientists, to participate in that research translation. I am thinking, for example, of SUSINC, which has now um, hired or at least advertised for a director of actionable science whose job it is to help the researchers affiliated with SUSINC think about kind of how to translate that work. I know, for example, MIT has the International Policy Lab, which is a lab, again, designed to help faculty at MIT sort of navigate that process and recognizing that it is an add-on activity. So I think looking at places that are starting to invest in those kind of support services for faculty is another solution. Yeah, I think that's, that's totally right. I was just going to just quickly say that there's one of the things that I think there's a, there's a sort of a push and a pull that'll need to happen to make it easier for people in your position 
to find those opportunities. And certainly, um, you know, there's a, Smith was one of the early leaders in this space, and there are now a few fellows programs like that around the world that are doing that. And it's still a handful of people. And the connections they make at that early stage in their career have been pivotal. So one of the things we're doing is building that within different groups, within health, within natural sciences, within, and within major challenges, food, health. How do you get fellows around those areas, global groups of fellows to come together with interdisciplinary groups to, to have that opportunity? But it's still, even if we're super successful, going to be you know, 100 people or something like that. Um, I think there, there's an opportunity to, um, to for institutions and for faculty institutions to push pretty hard um, because it's now, a very, it's now, there are now institutions in this country that are raising 10, 50, 60 million dollars on sustainability science for major things and they're not in the places where you think they'd be. Bloomington, Indiana, for example, other places like that, that have gotten their regions together and said, we're going to make a maker push out of this because we see this as the future of higher education. ASU is another one. This is another one that has an opportunity to do that. There are probably a dozen university presidents who probably probably should sit around the same table sometime soon to come up with a bit of a manifesto for the changes in higher education that's required, and we need to push them to be at that table. So I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a push back and forth we can use to influence the system maybe a bit faster than it's willing to go on its own. Oh, and one, little tiny, one little tiny thing, Joel. So I, I'm going to disagree with the person who um, posed the question, but um, we do need sexy science. We as land managers, and that's what I go back to because that's what I do, we need the science, but we need the translation to the average park manager where, or protected area, wherever that is, so they know how to apply it. If, if it can't be applied, it's just being left out there in the air. And I find this in the National Park Service all the time. We do a very small bit of research, and it's mainly with wildlife health. But unless you have that companion piece, whatever form that takes, to inform that manager on the ground of how to use this, how to apply it, and, and either at their local level or landscape level, um, we're kind of missing a boat there. So yes, we need the science. I was going to chime in one thing on this too. I think there's actually, a, <laughs> I think there's a lot of programs that are, I, I totally disagree with the, the comment that you, you have to do theoretical or basic science. I don't, I think that model has changed drastically. I think even in the biology department here, which is in my mind biased towards the basic, they, they, they're doing more applied sciences than the, a generation ago. Um, our department's completely applied. Our funding, the funding units that, f that where the money came for the basic sciences, that pot is dwindling. And I think that the, what, what's been successful in my career hasn't been going to the basic science. It's been looking for collaborations on the applied sciences side. In some ways, I think that's the area where the growth is in, in, in our academic landscape. I also think when you're looking at some of the really exciting programs going on, it's integrative programs where they're bringing uh, environmental science and law programs, or they have a policy, their policy school has now set up a specific, in, you know, environmental direction, or, or I don't know what you call it, like a sub, sub major or something like that. And so these are, these are blooming out all over the place in academia. And so that, that integration and that application, I think is the growth area. I, I don't think it is, I don't see it the other way around. I want to thank Sarah in the back for that question because we can see that she certainly infused the panel. Uh, <laughs> nice. Um, also, uh, I'll point out that there are about two million peer-reviewed papers in science a year and how much of that is digested in the public sector. We have another question. We have one over here first, actually. Okay. So. <clears throat> Hi. So I was wondering, um, I mentioned, or I remember uh, Sarah mentioned this, and I remember Josh added on to it. Um, Y'all talked about needing more connection, like a cross-discipline dis connection. And I was wondering where the panelists thought um, that could be best handled, like where we could build those connections. Go ahead. Oh, no, 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 that's right. You, you, you're, uh, I mean, so, uh, all right, fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. So you yes, so I mean, I, I would first make a distinction between um, the, the training that is needed to work effectively across disciplines and the training that's re required to work effectively across sectors of society. I think those are really different skill sets. I think one, when I spent three or four years, I was an academic for about 15, 20 years, moved to start to do science within an NGO context, and the difference I found there was that like in academia, we all have different goals and we all speak the same language, and in civil society, um, 
none of us come from the same place. We all speak different languages, but we all have the same goal, and it's written down. And if my tool doesn't help get us to that goal, on to the next tool. And so, so it's this really different space in where in whether to do science. So I think there are two complementary skill sets in that space that you, you want to go after. On the first one, it, working across, there, there have been some really nice federal programs from the National Science Foundation, for example, there were the IGERT program, which is now the, what's the next one that came up after IGERTs? That is the interdisciplinary program that connects across disciplines. There are opportunities to do that as a graduate student that um, I think have major like knock-on effects later on. The last thing I'll say on this is that I think we do our graduate students a terrible disservice in this country by not training more explicitly in, trans, in, in the skills needed to work across disciplines and the skills needed across sectors because most labs train their students to, not all, but most labs train their students to be academics. And yet, at least in the biological sciences, which I know, about 8% end up as a, you know, tenured professors or even, ten, even tenure track professors, which means 92% of our constituencies aren't really being trained very well for the jobs that they're getting. And so there's this great opportunity to think about, to build on the successful training programs that are linking students across disciplines and across sectors so that they're much more, they, they can jump into that job market much faster earlier on. I, I don't know the ones that are, all the ones that are here, but SOGIS I think is probably the center of that on campus. So, and I'll just add to that to say that um, what, what I meant to say, um, and, and certainly interdisciplinary collaboration is super important for all of the things we're talking about, and there's quite a bit of good scholarship and a number of good programs that, you know, like we were just saying, have been designed to facilitate the skills needed to do that. I'm, I'm talking more about sort of reaching outside of science, and um, I don't think there's a huge number, you know, outside of the example I already highlighted, the Smith Fellows programs, of programs that are designed specifically to provide those skills, because a lot of those skills are about relationships and, um, uh, yeah, about interpersonal relationships. And so my suggestion kind of in early career would be to look to work for or work with someone who already does that and can give that kind of on-the-job training. Um, and, and the piece of advice I would tack on to that is, but also think carefully about kind of the topic or the set of relationships that you would build in that role, because many of us, I'm sure, on this panel would find that those, those topics and those relationships tend to persist in your career. <laughs> so kind of once you make them in the first place, that's often going to define what you end up doing later. Um, but, but I would look for that on the job training. And then the, the one kind of really targeted skill that I think is enormously helpful in this area, not nearly enough of us have, is skills at facilitating, designing and facilitating meetings of people. Okay, hi, I'm Victoria. Um, so my question, you guys have all s spoken about um, um, the science and the necessity of it and then bringing different organizations to the side of the big table, um, getting more people to the national parks, um, different societies and communities in the Americas and elsewhere in the world. And so well, this is about transforming awareness into action, right? And so you have all this awareness, this increase of awareness, as George said, um, with 70% of the population in America now actually accepting um, the facts of climate change. And so this is occurring and it's great, but then how do you get people who aren't in science and people of different generations to get to participate in that action, but feel like they have the opportunity to participate in it and actually feel like they're making a difference, whether they're in science or not, whether it's, you know, a child who's in a community, um, you know, in a poorer community in Chicago versus, you know, a, a more privileged child, you know, going to a better school and things like that, where they actually feel like they can make a difference. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. oh, I'll just, real quick. So I talked a little bit about this new program that we started called the Community Stewardship Program. And I'll just give you an example of exactly what you're talking about, I believe. And so there's this small national monument in Georgia called Alkmaldi. And it's a mound, the mound um, indigenous people from years and years ago. And it's a rather small cultural park, but it's expanding. And it's right across from Macon, Georgia. 
so one of the most depauperate places in the country as far as economics. Um, right on the boundary of this park is um, a housing unit. Um, again, it's generally single mothers and it's a largely African-American population. And then there's this park across a barbed wire fence. <laughs> so barbed wire fence, what does that tell you right now? How welcoming is that? Um, and then there's a huge river corridor, which is considered one of the most diverse in the state. And, and really, the state considers it a very uh, important critical area for wildlife movement, which runs adjacent to the park. And so this community stewardship program is taking these kids, and it's not like they're going to want to go out there and see how many bears are actually, they don't want to hear about the bears moving through the park, right? That's a pretty scary thing for folks in that part of the world. Um, but what we want to do is everybody has an, has an iPhone. So we take them out and we do iNaturalists, and we do these little things, you know, let's look at some invertebrates, let's look at butterflies. Who doesn't like butterflies? So, you know, we have had um, these butterfly bio blitzes of five to 900 kids out there in this small, tiny park that we help support because we prioritize this. So instead of the kids now uh, climbing over the fence to vandalize the park, they're protecting the park. They actually have spread that word throughout their housing development and across the river and the railroad tracks to say, hey, you guys can't come into my backyard and do this. They have, we have taken kids from fourth grade to high school who are now so interested in protecting that area and learning more about it through the use of technology, you know, and their moms are happy. They're not spending all their time just talking on their iPhone or doing whatever they're doing on their iPhone. They're using it for something productive that they can connect to. And out of this came a stellar example of a young girl who's about 15, and she always thought she just wanted to be a writer or work for a news organization, and she thought she could never get there. And through this and helping her find her passion and, and just giving her a stepping stone, a little rung on the ladder, she's now interning at a local news station on environmental projects. That's great. So th there's little things you can do. Again, it's about prioritizing what matters. That is, a, that is an awesome example. And I, what I love about that example is it's, also, it's so grounded locally in, in where people are, right? Um, the two examples I, I was going to give are <coughs> Doris Duke Conservation Scholars Programs, which pick students up at the undergraduate level and do three years of, uh, of intensive training, um, and, and the Global Sustainability Scholars Program. Both of those are focused on underrepresented groups in sciences, um, in conservation, in, in Doris Duke, and in sustainability in the Global Sustainability Scholars Program. And they focus explicitly on the relationship between power and privilege and conservation. And they really focused on why this room looks the way it looks. Why, we, why this is the people gathered for biodiversity and not another group. And who should be gathered and who is going to be benefit most and lose worse from the decisions made about biodiversity. And how do you write that wrong? And, and so I think these kind of programs that sort of really take the, hit it on the head that power, privilege, and, and how you grow up in the world matters to your beliefs about biodiversity, and that my understanding of biodiversity as a white privileged male in this country is totally different than, than the, how I'm going to approach that from a, from a marginalized group in this country or in Germany or in South Africa or in Vietnam. That all of our communities have power relations that if we don't deal with them, we're not going to solve the problems. So I think those programs are really good. In this country, I say Doris Duke, the Doris Duke programs, there's about five of them in the country, one in Washington, one in Arizona, there's one in Florida, are fantastic places for undergraduates. And then the application for the international one on sustainability just opened this week. And that's something we, we run at Future Earth. We have a question in the back right of the room. And Sarah, you wanted to say something? Well, I'm going to insist on saying this only because it's another example, but it's a very local example, and I wanted to highlight it for the benefit of the folks in the room who live here at Fort Collins, and that is that um, it's the Nature in the City initiative, which is run by the city of Fort Collins, um, and I've been working on it in collaboration with Luba Pechar, who's another faculty member in our department and co-leads that working group at the School of Global Environmental Sustainability. The goal of this project is to create a connected open space network throughout the city that's accessible to the entire community, provides habitat for plants and wildlife, and a variety of experiences for people. 
And we originally became involved in this project in 2014 as technical advisors, helping the city think about kind of how to incorporate their environmental goals in the, to the strategic plan for how to conserve this open space network. And it's really just grown from there. We ended up helping them to co-found a, um, a citizen science program that has continued the biodiversity monitoring of birds and butterflies, which we picked intentionally because they're things that people like and know how to see. Um, so it's a participatory monitoring program that occurs every summer in the city and involves citizen volunteers in collecting that data. Um, but what's really cool is there's not just sort of that um, learning opportunity and an engagement goal, but the city is actually taking the data that's collected by these city volunteers, incorporating it into models, and using it to make decisions about where development should and should not occur, where conservation should and should not occur, and where management should change to create those benefits for both people and wildlife. So again, I think often these examples are highly local, but I think it's a really strong example of how you can kind of integrate those participation opportunities with conservation outcomes. You and I need to talk. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Elena. Uh, I'm an undergrad here, and so my question is actually very similar to the one that was just asked. Hi. Um, uh, so I'm an undergrad, and while I might be interested in going to academia someday, uh, right now I'm not there at all. Um, so how do I, as an individual, get involved with uh, action to support biodiversity? Um, you've mentioned citizen science. Are there other opportunities? Are there other resources that people like me or myself can reach out to and uh, support these, these systems. I'll start. I think there's a lot of opportunities and obviously it's, it's just trying to find those and navigate through the world, but volunteer opportunities for sure, internships, don't dismiss the county, state, and federal government citizen science programs or volunteer. We have a teacher ranger teacher program where we develop curricula based on biodiversity issues. So lots of those. And here in Fort Collins, there's an amazing network that goes on here. I mean, just about what Sarah was talking about, we work with the Law Familiar Center, l largely Hispanic. And, and the fact is that those kids had never been to Rocky Mountain National Park their families, so we're always looking for volunteers to help with some of those sort of things. So also looking at not just the volunteering to do citizen science or help us organize it, but also looking at the methodologies and you know the metrics, and we need more rigorous metrics and methodologies so that a lot of scientists tend to dismiss citizen, citizen science, so we don't want that to happen because it's valuable. Crowdsourcing crowdsourcing is where it's at right now to get anything done that we need to get done on a large scale. So yeah, I, there's lots of opportunities, especially right here in Fort Collins. I would just add to that to say, um, you know, I think it's, an, it may seem like an obvious option to sort of look for internships or volunteer opportunities or jobs with, say, a conservation NGO like the Wildlife Conservation Society where I work. But I think that there's also tremendous value in getting experience in those other contexts that are important for kind of making the decisions that affect biodiversity. Like the personal example I can give is that after college, I knew I was interested in the intersection between land development and conservation, but I didn't know if I wanted to work on the planning side or on the research side. And I went for a couple of years and worked for a private planning firm and an affordable housing developer. And I still go back to the experiences that I gained in those two years, just the understanding of kind of what was motivating those decisions and what kind of the constraints were on what those actors were able to do in guiding the work that I do now. Yeah, I was gonna chime in. I think uh, in general, there's, there's a lot of organizations out there working on different aspects of conservation in, in local communities. Obviously, a lot of this stuff to, to take, have an impact, uh, cr depend on where you are in your career, typically you would start locally. Um, I think one thing that people under recognize is, is that there's, there's uh, convening bodies or there's organizations doing different projects that often, that locally, that often lack expertise or, um, or have um, you know, certain skill sets or certain strengths that could be diversified in some ways. And so as, as you gain skills or as you uh, learn, interact with different projects, you start to have greater, um, greater ability to contribute. 
And so getting involved in local organizations at an early stage, learning different process, different approaches, um, bringing your knowledge to them is, is the way you're going to broaden your scope of impact. Um, and also it's going to help you figure out where your skill sets are most effective. And I think this is something that's underserved by this, especially the scientifically trained community, is that often academic scientists often are siloed and they aren't uh, offering that expertise to the groups locally that could really value and use it. Kate Novak, my question is for the whole panel. Um, at what is a, a time of rising international tensions? Um, when uh, many, or I will say some countries are turning inwards and putting their nations first. Can you give some concrete examples of ways in which uh, international cooperation and conservation can continue to be mobilized and, and uh, in which we can uh, maintain the momentum uh, for transboundary uh, conservation? Thanks. That's great. I don't have to start, but I'm sure there's lots of ways of doing this. Um, I would just sort of say that, you know, to start with, that um, science has always been one of the sort of foundational parts of diplomacy, and, by, and, and it has been actually one of the most stable parts of diplomacy when nations start to drive apart. And that's because the scientific communities need each other because of, their, because of the interactions they form a lot more than other sectors of society. And the societies, the international scientific societies that stitch scientists together across these disciplines have been really, really useful at actually you know, tempering some of the, some of the, the I mean, in an actual diplomatic sense, some of the, the, the issues that have gone on um, out in other sectors of society. So, um, you know, supporting things like the International Council of Science, which most people are like, what is that group? It's a, an organization of organizations. It is the group that helps make that happen, the International Council of Social Sciences. Future Earth now does that for sustainability to some extent. Um, these global, these global glue organizations, these boundary organizations, um, also exist, of course, in civil society, right? And so those that have strong, strong connections across countries. I worked for WWF for some time. And, you know, one of the interesting things, you know, some of the diplomacy and conservation are not unlinked. And so part of the connections between countries come from how influence can be shifted with, with, with conservation. You know, when Myanmar opened up, for example, you know, there w it, was not, it was not by you know, accident that WWF US was actually moving that program forward. That was a national interest that comes from the State Department sort of issues. So there are links in conservation that can turn what can be a kind of a difficult situation into a positive one. And sometimes it's the civil society organizations that have the capacity to do that. And other times it's the scientific organizations that do it. Um, those are not the specifics. Those are sort of the general spaces. I would say that um, forming and maintaining your international collaborations um, are, is, is, is kind of a part of being a global citizen. And, and that's what we should all be sort of that. I found that hugely beneficial and in times when I get a little bit down on where I might be locally. I'll just add something. I think in the, in the context that you laid out that there's sort of maybe this, um, this switch or, or switch in focus more to become more introverted by some of these nations, I think that opens up um, space for, for global or, or international or multi-country um, actions that, um, that is obviously going to be hard to fill compared to, say, federal activities that are, are better funded, but it opens up opportunities as well. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty critical that, that some of these uh, positions and some of these convening activities and, and interactions are filled by non-government non uh, groups now. And so you could look at it in the other way, that it's opening opportunities. And, and I'll add a little bit, just sort of bringing it down into the weeds at the local level of the Americas, right? So, so keep those partnerships going. I mean, you have solid partnerships, especially when you're talking about shared species and shared habitats and shared common goals, right? Um, you know, red knots, humpbacks, northern yeah. right whales, yeah, yeah. turtles. Yeah. Keep those relationships going so that you have those connections. There's no better person to talk about that than Joel, working on projects all the way from Wrangell St. Elias to Chile. So we have to keep going. We have to stay the course, remember what the mission is, um, and don't catastrophize. So, you know, but also don't raise any flags that can get 
you know, have a, a laser pointed at them, right? Just keep going and, and uh, persevere. And I think we can do that. Um, Jacob um, is going to have somebody ask a final question, and then I'll have mm -hmm. a and then Chris will. Wow. Um, OK, so who are you? My name is Chad Seidel. Um, so for a while, I've wondered why our uh, culture doesn't allow much space for grieving, and uh, like grieving extinct species, and the sadness of extinct species. Um, and I recently found a group of people who started a, an official Remembrance for Lost Species Day, which is on November 30th. Um, and I'm looking to participate with anyone who wants to participate in that. Um, but my question is about your relationship to grieving and make your question relative to the question that we're trying to focus on, which is how to bring awareness of biodiversity to action? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, think our, I think it is very relevant to think of our culture as um, suppressing sadness, and if we can connect with, connecting with our grief in order to feel more connected to, re to reality, I think that's relevant, but... So you can skip, you can. No, 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 I'll, I'll hit that. So I, I, I mean, I, um, I used to study chilies for a living, right? Because I wasn't too concerned about which questions were most important. I was most concerned about which questions were f most fun to answer. Why chilies are hot is a really fun question to answer. It takes you to great places in the world, does great field work. It's pretty easy to find. You can explain it in about one sentence, great stuff. Um, but really, if we never figure it out, we'll probably be OK. Um, for the most part, um, most of society won't grieve the loss of that, that question gone unanswered. Um, but I increasingly start my lectures talking about um, Catcher in the Rye, because I feel like a lot of scientists these days are feeling like Holden Caulfield out in that field of ryegrass in that dream, when he's sitting there trying to catch kids going over the edge of the cliff. Because we've been spending our lives working on ecosystems and species that despite all of our, ac our best efforts are disappearing in front of us. We are the world's expert on a species that's dying in front of our eyes. That's grief for so many people in this space. And I think being able to express that and then act on it and change your way of working so that you channel that into stuff into into so the next group of scientists coming up and the next group of passionate conservationists can have greater success i think that's sort of the that was for me a pivotal piece of being able to see just how powerful the lost species loss is in my own life and being able to publicly recognize that that we're lost in this space and it really hurts to see these things go and that is a catalyst for some of us and so i think we have to think of it that way and speak about it and quickly, and I completely understand where you're at. I'm a federal scientist, so um, outwardly I'm not allowed really to grieve. <clears throat> but trust me, when I go home, I, I do that. I feel terrible about some of the things that are happening in this world. But what do I do? I turn that into action, and that's what I have to do. It's like, I just became a grandmother. Damn it, my kids are going to see condors in the wild when they're adults and their grandchildren and you know what are those plants out there that need restoration that are a little less controversial than maybe the condors or whatever the grizzly bears right but i'm going to turn that into action and so i continue to try to be as persuasive as i can to look at recovery efforts and participate as much as i can in those things so i'm gonna thank the panel but um